we are happy with us. Uh, we are happy to have with us Dr. Jorge Hidalgo. I had the pleasure to meet him in Georgia this summer. So Dr. Jorge Hidalgo he is originally from Mexico, where he obtained his bachelor in agronomy and master's in animal breeding and genetics from the Universidad Autónoma de Chapingo. He earned his PhD in animal breeding and genetics at the University of Georgia, where he is currently a postdoctoral research associate. So thank you, Jorge, for being with us today, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Ivan. Um, thank you to all the organizers for this opportunity, and I will share my screen. Can you see now? Yes, I see the PowerPoint though. OK, let me see. Can you see the full screen? Not yet, right? No, not yet. Okay. I think I need to stop them, put this full. OK. <clears throat> so I think now you, you should see the full, right? Yes. OK, awesome. yeah. so thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending this presentation. So I will speak a little bit about my experience with my recent project, and it is related to transforming linear solutions to probability scale uh, in the analysis to facilitate the analysis of categorical data. Uh, this has been done in, in uh, using uh, Ameri the American Angus Association data and of course uh, in collaboration with with them and all the group here in, in QGA in Georgia. So you know uh, in animal breeding and genetics we are interested in making genetic progress on on the traits and several traits they don't follow what we call a continu continuous distribution so in theory or, or, or uh, not in theory well it is Declare it is a uh, proof that we actually violate many of the assumptions of the linear models if we use those. This is because these uh, phenotypes they are they have a discrete distribution or a categorical distribution. They don't follow the continuous. So, because of that, several several research has been done in that, and a very robust and very nice and elegant theory was developed about that, and this is what we call in, in animal breeding the threshold model. So in that, in the threshold models, we assume that an underlying uh, variable exists, and this maps to the discrete uh, classes of the phenotypes via a threshold model. So the idea is very simple if the if the liability of the or, or the underlying variable exceeds the threshold so we ex, we as uh, well the phenotype express is in this case for example the number two let me get my my pointer i'm sorry for this one in this case if the liability of exceeds the threshold uh, the phenotype that is expressed is number two Otherwise, is a category or, or phenotype number one. And assume that this is, for example, what I studied here is Calvinist, and uh, the category number one is easy Calvin, and category number two is uh, difficult Calvin. So having this assumption of the liability in the threshold model give us uh, the, the, the possibility of basically using an underlying linear model. That's what I call. But this, this is we can use a linear model transformed to the to the discrete uh, discrete scale. But to do that, we also we, we need to do some a nonlinear transformation. This theory was uh, actually developed uh, at the same time uh, independently for Gianola and Foulet in the 90, 1993 and Harville and me in 1984. So these two groups, they derive an equivalent system of nonlinear equations, which uh, must be solved iteratively. So because, because of, the, as of the linear model, uh, because of the threshold model, I'm sorry, 
because we use the liability and we assume that this is normally distributed on the underlying scale. So then we have normally distributed solutions in the, the underlying scale. So this leads to a very, very nice and very important uh, feature of the, of the threshold models that consists in that we can transform those liabilities or those solutions in the underlying scale to probabilities. And then we can express the breathing value in the probability of serving the phenotype of, of, of interest for us, the most important, the, the category of, of uh, main importance. So then this is really easy to use, it's really easy to interpret, and it, it is actually the current standard for the industry. But because the, the linear of equations is no, non-linear, and then we must solve this iteratively, this is this has a this has a computational complexity complexity. So what we can see in co in contrast with the act with the simple linear model is that we have long computing times. Uh, sometimes we have convergence issues, um, and these challenges are are intensified nowadays with the genomics era. You know, using the genomic data, uh, it creates many benefits because we can actually uh, observe or uh, infer the realized relationships instead of those uh, expected relationships in the A matrix. But then the, the, the system of equations is very dense. And uh, on top of the nonlinear system of equations of the threshold model, this creates even more challenges from the computational point of view. And just to give you uh, a little bit of taste of what I'm talking about is uh, a non-genomic analysis can take uh, five from five to ten times uh, less uh, time to run than a genomic analysis in the context of the threshold models. So what are possible alternatives that we uh, have to alleviate this, this, uh, this burdening of these challenges that we have in the genomics area? Perhaps the most obvious, and this is uh, the one that we are pursuing here, is uh, the use of a linear model. So we know that the theory is, is, is very robust, but it has uh, very challenges, and they, they are intensified now with the genomic data. So we have to, to look for alternatives. Uh, the linear model is very attractive uh, because usually if we run with the same data, so the correlation between the solutions is very high. You you can you can see that this is actually no a new topic, and there are there are abundant research in this in these regards, and uh, most of the time the correlations are equivalent, almost equivalent. So they they are um, uh, equal or greater than 0 0.96. But as I mentioned before, one of the nicest uh, features of the of the threshold model is the transformation to probabilities, and we don't have this feature on the linear models. So uh, this actually is, is the constraint to apply the linear model because it's, it's no it's no it's no easy to get this this uh, transform or at least it's not very defined how to get the transform the, the probabilities from the linear solutions. So with that in mind, we we uh, we set the objective of this research, and we wanted to find a transformation that gives us equivalent GBVs already transforming probabilities uh, using the solutions from 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 the in fact from the linear, but we wanted to to be to match them with the current standard, which is the the solutions from the threshold model. Then. If we achieve that, so then then can be used as as is currently being used for the for the selection purpose. So to do that, we use data from the American Angus Association. Uh, we use data from the official evaluation for Bird and Calvinis. We run this as a two tray uh, two tray model, uh, and this is a model that has. Uh, direct and maternal effects. All these details are uh, somehow important on, on, on the 
on the conclusions and the results that I will show before. So that's what I'm, I'm mentioning. And we have many, many data in this data set. So we have uh, more than 9 million uh, animals in the pedigree and no, sorry, more than 9 million uh, records for bear weight and almost 2 million records for the Calvinist, the actual uh, binary or categorical trait. 11 million in the pedigree and a little bit more than 1 million of animals they have genotypes. So we ran the, the evaluation with the official uh, statistical model and, and we use single step GBLAB with APY and we put uh, 20, 22,000 animals in the core set for, for the analysis. So one one of the main challenges that we face down the road in the in the research was uh, which uh, genetic parameters to use. So as we were comparing threshold model uh, with the linear model, and this is in the only only for the binary. So the official now now right now the official is uh, it is actually a threshold linear model. So the Calvinist is the threshold and the Bergway uh, naturally use, uses the linear model. So either we run that one, the linear, the, the threshold linear, or the linear linear two train model. Uh, for the genetic parameters, we have three options basically, and we explore the three down the road on the research. The first one is use uh, estimated uh, variances, uh, heritability, correlations using the threshold model. The second one is estimate those parameters using a linear model. And a third one is you can you can transform the linear the, the parameters that were estimated with the threshold model to the linear scale. Well, I play with all these scenarios, and what was better is always to estimate the genetic parameters using the threshold model and then transform those to the linear scale. So the transformation I'm going to show uh, a little bit later um, how I did the transformation is actually uh, the theory behind that is, is, uh, is, is very established. So this is something feasible. And uh, here I want to mention that when I was playing and transforming, uh, estimating the, the parameters with the linear model gave me reasonable good results, but they were not as good as, as, as with the parameters estimated from the threshold model and then transformed. So in this, in this, um, at this stage of the research, our recommendation is to estimate the parameters using the threshold model, and still we, we use actually the threshold models. And this was important because we, with the, with with our accurate or reliable genetic parameters, we were not able to get uh, very good results. I really enjoyed reading uh, the only research that I found related to contrasting the, the estimation of uh, variance components uh, uh, between the threshold and the linear model. This is a research from uh, Colorado State University from the 90s. And actually, they they said what I what I saw after I played with this. I saw this thesis and a couple of papers for, from these researchers, and that was really nice. They say the real advantage of the threshold model because there is many research that says for predictions the solutions are highly correlated. So it is it's actually hard to justify the extra computational effort that you need with the threshold model. But for variance components, this is they they did actually a very nice uh, comprehensive uh, simulation study, and they proved that for variance components is is the the main advantage of using the threshold model. So in a sense, we 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 need or we are we we need the threshold models. But I believe uh, the the variance components estimation is a process that we don't do so often. So it's something feasible that we can do, well, depending on the population, but we can do every year or I don't know, every half a year or even even longer time. So it's still, it's still is something feasible. But I, I forgot the beginning, but I will mention now that uh, those challenges from the threshold models in the 
time constraint is 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 now very very important for those uh, for those institutions that run weekly evaluations or, or by weekly or something but often often uh, often run the predictions so they they have a limited time to to get the the solutions so with that we estimated the uh, the generic parameters the variance components with the threshold model and then we transform to the pro to the linear scale so here what i want to highlight in red is that i only transform of course the uh, the variance components associated to calvinese per way uh, remain exactly the same and as the correlations the, the correlations are invariant to changes in the scale, so I didn't change, of course, the, the correlations. This is uh, the formula that we use for uh, transforming the heritability from threshold to linear scale, and it, it was actually uh, as well uh, developed by, well, the original one was uh, for a binary tray was uh, derived by Dempster and Lemster, and then Daniel Janola extended for any any number of category, categories that is the one that I'm showing here. So one important point here, and um, I mentioned in all, all details because I, I hope to open the discussion in this regard and possibly the curiosity of more research, is these formulas were derived for very for the simple animal model when we only have the additive variance uh, and the residual variance. So, so this formula allows us to obtain the additive variance and the phenotypic variance in this ratio. So in this case, I have even maternal, uh, maternal effects or other effects like the, the random contemporary group for Calvinist. And uh, what I did is based on the additive and the total or the phenotypic variance, then I derived the other components relative to its contribution to the phenotypic variance in the in the liability scale. OK, so what about the, the transformation? The transformation to probability originally is given in this in this way is the is the formula on the top. And we 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 subtract the contribution of fixed effects and the breathing values from the threshold. The threshold is estimated on the, on the threshold models at the same time of the of the fixed effects and the breathing values, and one of the challenges here was okay. So we want to switch to the linear models, but we don't have the threshold on the linear models, and we naturally we face several challenges. We struggle with this part, and um, I, I will I will show what, what, what was the the complete story. So at the beginning, we came up with this uh, uh, proposition, with this formula that was mainly uh, adjusting for the mean and standardizing the breeding values and then transforming to probabilities. And this, this was what we call independent transformation because later we came with a second idea. In fact, one of my colleagues here at UGA, Matthias Berman, we came with the idea of, of a, a conditional transformation as this is um, a maternal model. So he say, okay, let's try uh, conditioning the direct breathing volume, the maternal and vice, and we can do uh, also the opposite, but I, I'm going to show only the results for the maternal, for the direct effect, I'm sorry. And the reasoning behind this is that having more information, having a second source of information, we can we can reduce the uncertainty uh, around the estimation of this breathing value and uh, and get better better results. And, and just for for the sake of uh, be clear on the results, what I'm going to show in, in the black is is what I'm calling the independent transformation and in, in blue in the results is what I'm calling the condition. OK, this is nothing new, but just to just to show that we uh, are in line with the previous results. So the correlations for the solutions before any transformation, they are pretty high, especially in this population, because we have a lot of data. So all of them 
if you consider all animals, only sires of sires with many progeny and many records or animals with records, for all the groups of animals, the correlation is, is always pretty high. Uh, I'm showing these groups because in, in, in the, the research has been proved that uh, the, the agreement is much better for those animals with accurate breeding values of sires with, uh, with more progeny, which, is, which makes sense because it's, 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 it's uh, more data. The more data, the more uh, close to normality the, the family means. And there, there, there are several uh, theoretical justifications for that. But in these cases, the population has many data for basically for all the groups of animals we obtain good results. In terms of time, we we, we ran the analysis and we uh, got 145 hours for the uh, original linear threshold model and 32 hours for the linear linear. So the memory usage as we use the same data is, is, is the same. But as you can see, the 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 the, the, the increase in time is, as I mentioned at the beginning, five times in this case. Um, and just to show you graphically, this is the pattern of uh, convergence of the of the analysis. Above we have the linear linear model is is much easier to converge. Is uh, is is that's why it's faster. So. You know, this is not exactly the same analysis on the threshold model. We also estimate the thresholds, and, and uh, this has another uh, another uh, element to in the computations. Okay, so now let me show you uh, the main results. So these are, in this case, I'm showing the the distribution of, of solutions in the original scales. You will see in black uh, linear linear solutions and in red the, the liability of threshold solutions. As you can see, the solutions are are, are actually pretty different. Well, the the scale is, is different, but when we apply the transformation, the the scale is pretty similar. And they almost fully overlap. And we also, as a second metric uh, of of the agreement, we compute we com we compute the genetic trends. So the correlations were still 0.99, um, either on the before transforming, after transforming, and the the, the genetic trends follow similar trend. So in fact, in this point was when when uh, Matthias suggested the conditional transformation to to try to see if we got a better agreement, and then. Uh, we ran the conditional transformation, and this was what happened. In fact, yeah, it was it was uh, a little bit well, even better. So the the the, the genetic trends agree better. They 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 overlap, and the and the distribution looks nicer. So so far, uh, we were happy with these results. So then I start talking with more people and giving feedback. And uh, I, I, well, I have many names to say, but uh, I, I have to thank you, all of these people that uh, interact with me and gave me uh, feedback. That uh, it's, it's several people to say also. I don't want to forget uh, any of them. And so far, they say, well, that's really interesting, actually, because you are you are showing, you you guys are showing that the correlations are pretty high. Genetic trends is, is is the same, so there is no evidence of any losses in the in the in the genetic progress. But then, from the practical point of view, implementation, the main the main critic that they said is, well, the probability is centered about fifty percent. What is what is the incidence of this trait? And I say, well, yeah, the incidence of Calvin or di difficult Calvin is seven percent. So ninety ninety three percent of the of the Calvins are easy here. And they say, well, you know, if you apply the the original transformation, is nicer. The theory is very. That's why it's nice because is you will have most of the animals in this population with a high probability because uh, most of them have easy Calvin, right? 
okay, so that, that was one of the, the critics. And then I struggle and I say, yeah, that's true. In fact, yeah, like most of the animals with 50% of Calvinese in, the, in this population, well, uh, I know it doesn't affect the genetic trend, but from the practical uh, applications, so several questions to to answer, right? So then I went, I I went back to the original transformation and I ran what is the original, and uh, yeah, what they say was true actually. Most of the animals have a high probability of easy Calvin, and as you can see here, for example. 50% of the po of the probability is is only a, a a small fraction of the population that has less than 50% of the of the probability to, for easy calvin. So this uh, well at this point I say ah okay so now I, I I fully understand what they were talking about. This is this is what is 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 kind of different from the practical application to apply. So the scale is 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 different. Okay, so the first thing that I try after here is, okay, what is happening in, in our transformation is this, because this is the original one. If we ignore the threshold, we center the probability in 50, which actually, in other words, means you assume that the threshold is zero, or the probability is, is 50. And that was what was happening in our uh, uh, formula to, to, to and our proposed formula to transform to probabilities. So then I, my my reasoning was, okay, so we have we are missing the threshold here, or we are assuming a threshold of zero, which is 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 not real. Uh, can we? I was wondering if we can can translate or estimate the threshold on the linear scale because you know so far i had the threshold analysis and this this is something important to mention because what we want to do is to migrate to the linear so we will not depend in any sense of the threshold but but of course doing the research here so i have the threshold so because of the threshold analysis i estimated this point and I know the area under this curve. So if I know the area under this curve, then I can infer this the threshold. So what I did is I translate this idea to the linear scale. So I know what is the area of the population that is below the threshold. So then I went and, and, and translate this threshold in the linear scale. But when I transform the, the probabilities, Mm, so the, the you know the the probabilities now they were not centered to 50 but still I don't get very good agreement on the scale so now I, I, it, it wasn't satisfying this so it wasn't very very good so I keep I keep reading and I keep going and then I read this and I, I, I reading this paper from Weller Mistal and Janola from 80, 88 actually. So I read this literally is like that in the paper. So the unit of measurement of estimates in the threshold model is the residual standard deviation. And then they gave an explanation and they said, well, to make comparable the units, you need to uh, multiply the threshold solutions times the, uh, the square root or the standard deviation of the residual variance, the standard residual variance from the linear scale, from the linear solutions. Okay, well, that, that was very good. So then I, I I tried that, and just to remind you, these are the original solutions. These are the scale is very different. When you apply this scaling, so you get very, very, uh, very similar scale solutions. So, that, so I, I, that, I, that was actually good. But then still, I, I, I have here the, the complication that I say, OK, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm actually bringing the threshold solutions to the linear scale. But uh, 
what I need to do, or, or I think what is what is more logical in my case, because I want to run only the linear model, is to bring the linear solutions to the to the threshold scale. So then I apply the the opposite reasoning and I I translate linear solutions to the to the threshold or to the liability scale, which is I think more appropriate. And well. At this point, I say, well, they, they look pretty pretty similar. So now I will apply the original transformation. And then as you can see, applying the linear transformation, but scaling before the solutions, we get very good agreement. It's not perfect. I, I'm still thinking how, how I may um, polish or fine tune this, but it's, it's pretty good. So the correlations is still uh, 0.99. And now it's not any more centered at, at, at the 50. As you can see again, 50% of the population in this case have very low probability of Calvinism, which really makes sense in this in this population. So this is this is the so far I'm in this point. Um, uh, several questions here. It's still, well, it's still I'm using the threshold. Um, I, I need to come up with with several ideas, but uh, I, I I can say so far. Well, if 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 we are running already the breeding program and we have estimates of the threshold, we can use that. Otherwise, we can assume a reasonable threshold that, in fact, is what we do in the in the practical application. We we don't estimate the threshold every time because the threshold. A little bit, but it's going to be moving if you add more data. So what we do is we actually fix this base, and then we run based on this in this big uh, fixed base the, the 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 analysis for certain time. So this this is what I'm I want to propose so far, and this is the 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 large results that I have. So so far I I have some conclusions. So. This is actually, again, this is not new, but the linear solutions are highly correlated. The more data, the, the better, according to the theory, and that's why in this population we have very, very high correlations. Um, of course, as this is a linear transformation, we will still uh, keep the, this, this, uh, these correlations very high. Um, in our first stage, um, the conditional transformation provided a better match it was a little bit better, so I'm trying to think how how can I can I can I can apply the the conditional at this point. So, but this is under under thinking and under research now. And what I found is that the scaling the linear solutions provide the the closest to the original and and the the easiest to 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 apply. The computing time can be reduced five times and. Uh, Thinking on this way, uh, this the, the linear model may enable uh, large scale evaluation with multiple categorical traits, and this this could be important because we can run two or three or, or, or four trait analyses that uh, join anal uh, traits that are highly correlated and perhaps less recorded, and then we can have these benefits of the multi trait analysis. But this is, of course, only feasible in the linear in the linear uh, analysis. So these are some of the future challenges. Um, uh, what is going to happen when I when I try with more categories? In theory, the more categories, the more close to the linearity or the continuous uh, distribution. So I'm hoping this is better. Uh, uh, what happens if I run only the, the the univariate analysis? Because in this case, even previous research have has proved that Bergway really really helps to to more accurate estimates for the Calvinists um, with less de data. In, in in line with my previous comment, what is going to happen with the uh, with the phenotypes that are less recorded? Or the, or the tray has a uh, stream or very low incidence. Uh, this is also also important and, and uh, future challenges to test. So with that, I, I would like to thank you and uh, 
all the questions and uh, especially the comments are very welcome to improve this this journey in this research. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, much Jorge, for a great presentation. And now you in the audience, if you have a question or a comment, um, you can use the, actually there's a reactions on your teams, so you can use that to raise your hand and then it will show me here and I can see your name and um, go in order if we have many people asking questions. I think that would work better. Ivan, yes. can you hear me? Yes, Flavio. Okay, I have a question. So, uh, first of all, Hidalgo, uh, I'd like to congratulate you for the presentation. It was really, really nice. You kind of, you, you, you have a, li uh, a lemon and you, you made a limonade. No, it's, it's <laughs> a very, very <laughs> a difficult topic even to, to explain. So, um, well, well done. Um, I have a, I'm curious, uh, you, you did a binary, right? You treat it as a binary trait, Calvin, is. Is that the way that they are uh, running uh, generic evaluation in Angus with just binary trait or you, you start with a simplified um, um, problem? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, doctor. I believe this is the, the official way that they run. Uh, I'm not 100% sure of all the details, but uh, what I know is the actual recording is from one to four, but then yes. very few animals have uh, three or four uh, class in the classes of three or four. They they have very few, so yeah. they combine those in the three, in the second class. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the reason. So. But but you mentioned that you like to to look at the multinomial uh, problem too, not just binary, but a multinomial distribution. But then, if they have a very few animals in those um, classes, then you are going to uh, to have a lot of problems, right? Yeah, I think yeah, be, yeah. because not in all levels of the physics effects you are going to have uh, animals with, uh, let's say, uh, need uh, need uh, sur surgery or something uh, cesarean section for instance yeah. so that will be very few then you're going to end up with this problem that you don't have uh, observations in certain mm -hmm. levels of the fixed effect so I, I just wonder how you're going to do the, the next step if you like to to expand to more than two uh, categories yeah that's that's very true doctor i agree i i believe uh Instead of trying with the with this uh, Calvinist, uh, trying a, um, another another tray like docility or one that is recorded in more classes and have more more uh, uh, de better data structure like um, no very uneven uh, with yeah, a, yeah. a very low incidence in the other class. Yeah, another another you comment that. Um, of course, using the birth uh, weight as a second trait in a two trait analysis, uh, because these traits are uh, correlated, generally correlated, would increase the accuracy. But but the, I think the main reason to use, in addition to the genetic aspect, is that it stabilizes the, the solutions for, for the threshold model. Right, it yeah. co converges faster, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what they what they found, and and it's, it's like that. But they call the stabilizing effect of the linear tray. Mm -hmm. It converges faster, and yeah. uh, as you say, yeah, as, as a second uh, benefit, they have the highly correlated, and they provide more information, so better accuracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my last my last comment. That's a very nice topic, so I have a lot of things to ask and, and, and think about. But um, have you dealt with the, the problem of doing, let's say, two trait analysis, but both traits are threshold traits? No, not no. yet. Okay. Not yet. So, 
if you when you do that, if you find a solution for this, uh, how to run <laughs> this type, mo mo uh, you can see most of the, the the software that you have in our field, they don't deal with this. They can, they can, you cannot run uh, two trade analysis when the, both trades are threshold trades. Uh, of yeah. course, they, they have th theory uh, why this is difficult, right? But I wonder if you have in your portfolio of investigation to try to solve the, <laughs> this. No, problem. I. I haven't I haven't done research on that, but I, what I know is that THR Gibbs is is able to handle several, but uh, uh, personally I haven't run this this analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe when they have a several, but at least one is continuous trade. Oh, yeah. that that's, that may be true. Yeah, 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 yeah. maybe right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks, Sid. I'll, go, I'll let other people to ask questions. Thanks Thank a lot. Thanks for the questions. All right, does anyone else have a question? Well, I, I have a question for him. Uh, it's actually so what I was thinking, as you mentioned uh, about the, the data structure that you had and for this uh, research, for this uh, experiment that you were doing, and it's quite a big data set, right? So I was wondering, and maybe you have read or done yourself something differently, considering a smaller data set, how would would that be become an issue if, you know, considering your um, your proposed math or to work with a different, uh, you know, transformation from linear to, to threshold. Do you, yeah, have you considered that? And if so, like how, how would we start to be a little concerned in terms of uh, perhaps the size of the data? Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's actually a pretty good question, Ivan. And in, in theory, we will have a better, uh, better agreement if we have more data. It's actually a fascinating topic, and it relies on the central limit theorem. And my Dr. Mistel told me that here, and then I started reading about that. And it, it, it's because the sires in this population, for example, they have many, many uh, offspring. So then many records that that's, uh, even when they have one and two uh, phenotypes, the phenotype is one and two, so on average, they have, let's say, 1.5, one of the sire. And the second sire, it, his, its average is 1.7 and so far. And you go, you go there, and then with many records per sire, the average per sire makes almost normal distribution. So it follows the, this central limit theorem. So that's, that's why you, we get very good agreement with linear. But with less, as you say, it's, it may not follow exactly the same, and, and we may have uh, lower correlation. I'm not, we want to try that, but I'm not sure. But also what I know is there are at least five or, or four uh, articles already published with SHIP that they have naturally less data. And uh, it was small data and they still get very good results, like uh, at least 0.96 uh, the correlation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you for, for that. Great explanation as well included. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah, so does anyone else have a, I would say like maybe a, a last question to our presenter today? Yeah, I think it was a great presentation and it, it left no room for, <laughs> for questions and just, I guess, the support for for what's what's coming, right, with your future challenge and, and then next the steps as you showed um, as uh, one thing I was considering also was yeah the, using other traits in multiple categories maybe Flavio now has a, a final question for you no it's, it's not really a question but it's a use the opportunity to comment what the dog said about the central limit theorem is that that's the reason why polygenic traits have a normal distribution usually Mm -hmm. because of this the same theorem so i, I teach this for my students <laughs> is um, 
So because we, I was wondering when you have this trace, a highly polygenic, right? They usually have many genes uh, uh, being expressed in that trait. You open up for more environmental effects. So all these effects combined of each gene plus the environment, um, regardless of the distribution of the genes, like the, the original distribution, regardless of the original distribution of the, the, the environmental effects, what you see in the phenotype that the sum of all these effects is a normal distribution. And it's because of this theorem, right? Mm -hmm. So regardless of the original scale, when you have all these um, contributions, right? Uh, in the, the Dalgo's case is for the mean of the sire, but it's the same principle. And, uh, uh -huh. but, but there is one, one assumption that the, the, these contributing effects are independent. We know that our genes are not completely independent, but because there are so many, and uh, uh, you, you end up expecting a normal distribution. Too. Just to link this, because this theorem, the people normally, not, they are not aware of it, but it's very, very important in many things that we do in animal breeding. It's, it's very, it's very important. <laughs> Thank you for the comment, Dr. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, it was a good way for, it to, for us to conclude this uh, CGO seminar. And so once again, thank you, Jorge, for being with us today and sharing your experience and uh, many things that I know you've been working on. And thank you all for joining us today in the audience. And I hope to see you all next Friday. Very good. Thank you for the opportunity. See you later. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Hidalgo. Yeah. Say hello to Daniela and uh, Dr. Misto for us. I will. Thank you, okay. everybody. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.